June 5th, 5 a.m., 25,000 white women, state capital, Denver, Colorado, demanding Democratic Governor Jared Polis sign an executive order, buy guns, and uh, ban guns and buy them back. Ban guns and buy them back. That's right. Just when you thought anti-gun groups couldn't get any crazier in this country, you now have a group that is calling for a ban on all guns via executive order and to buy them back. This is not just assault weapons. This is not just handguns, but we're including hunting rifles, bolt action rifles, shotguns, uh, presumably revolvers, muzzle loaders, everything ban all guns via executive order by the governor of Colorado and buy them back. We're going to get into it because it gets even crazier. Uh, I did a lot of research into this, so stay tuned for that. But first, what would a video about gun control and gun bans be without a pro-gun, gun-related advertisement? SDI is an online school that teaches students the techniques and skills needed to become successful in the firearms industry. They offer a host of courses that you'll love, from AR-15 or 1911 armor options, to shooting sports management, ballistics, gunsmithing, and more. They also have a host of funding options. The programs are approved for use of most TA and VA benefits and federal student aid based on eligibility. So visit SDI today via the link in the description box down below. Now, when I first came across this group, I'm going to be honest, I didn't think it was real. I thought it was an elaborate online troll. As you can see here, I first came across this group on Twitter where I saw the Firearm Policy Coalition posting about the group where it says mom's group takes on gun reform plans to ask the governor to ban guns. And it says here for the kids is a post pandemic movement that started with a Zoom call, but it's not child's play. Their mission is simple, ban guns. And down below, you can see me say obvious troll org, any idea who made it lol. And then one of my subscribers posted, is it though, in response to me, showing a video of Julia Lewis Dreyfus doing a collab with this group. Let's take a look at that. Hi there, it's Julia. On June 5th in Denver, Here for the Kids is organizing a peaceful sit-in to demand that we stop the number one killer of kids in this country, guns. Thousands have made their plans to be there. Please join the movement to save our kids from gun violence. Thanks. Now, if you don't know Julia, she is a pretty big star. She was one of the main people on the show Seinfeld, and she was the main character in the hit show Veep, which I'm a big fan of. And funny enough, upon seeing this, I have to admit, I still didn't believe it. I thought, oh my God, as you can see in this tweet, oh my God, she fell for it. Here's another celebrity endorsement, this time from talk show host Chelsea Handler. Hi, I'm Chelsea Handler, and I am here for the kids. It is time to end the nightmare of guns, which is the number one killer of kids in America. We, the people, demand our government to act. Check comments for more information. So I started doing some more digging into this group, and oh my god, I found out they were serious. I found out who their founder was. Their founder is Sarah Rao. As you can see here on the Here for the Kids website, Sarah Rao, founder, Tina Strawn, founder. So who is Sarah Rao? Well, Sarah Rao is the individual you saw at the intro of this video. The one who talked about the goal being to ban guns via executive order and buy them back. And I don't want to get into all the history. Of course, she ran for Congress. She was endorsed by the Justice Democrats. If you remember, that's the group that also backed Ilhan Omar, AOC, established by Cenk Uger, Kyle Kalinske, and these other folks. Of course, they later kicked out Cenk Uger. Uh, you know, for certain reasons, of course. But if there's anybody that you could pick in the world to embody the worst of wokeness, the most memeable, most radical version that you almost wouldn't even be able to believe is real of wokeness, it would be Sarah Rao. This is someone who unironically tweets things like this. What is it with white people coming here to say posts about racism and whiteness are not appropriate for LinkedIn? One, racism is the bedrock of every American workplace. Two, black, indigenous, and brown people spend a large chunk of each workday trying to survive white colleagues. White people have done everything to make my life miserable, yet I'm supposed to not hate white people, question mark? By the way, I'm sure there's a ton more, but unfortunately a while back she deleted her Twitter. It doesn't exist anymore, uh, but don't worry, she's still very active in the political scene. Now what Saira Rao is probably most known for is her venture with Regina Jackson known as Race to Dinner. Now here's the thing, I could explain what Race to Dinner is to you guys, but just to show you how crazy far left and insane this uh, concept and this lady is, I'm actually gonna get Anna Kasparian from the Young Turks, who's 
we've also seen has been pretty crazy on some issues, though she's been getting a bit better in recent times. I'm gonna get her to explain what race to dinner is. After George Floyd's murder, as companies faced pressure to demonstrate a commitment to racial justice, interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion exploded. The American market reached an estimated $3.4 billion in 2020 alone. Take Syra Rao and Regina Jackson as just one example. They run a business called Race to Dinner, and wealthy white women across the country pay them handsomely to come to their dinner parties to bash the host and her white friends as racists. They do this without knowing anything about the dinner guests, without ever having interacted with them. All they know about these individuals is the color of their skin, and automatically they assume these white women have anti-black prejudice in their hearts. How much do they charge? Well, if you ask me a lot, each dinner party initially cost $2,500 total, but the rate increased to $5,000 in 2020, gee, I wonder why. The funds cover a two hour dinner, which includes support from Race to Dinner's business developer, planning, travel for Jackson and Rao, and when applicable, a post event consultation. The cost of food was not included in the original dinner party fee. This is the perfect example of a DEI related grift that allows economically privileged women to engage in performative acts to feel like they're doing their part to fight racism. Of course, they're not actually doing anything to fight racism at all. And if they want to pay for that, great. But the race to dinner ladies have also published books and even put out a movie called Deconstructing Karen. As a result, their simplified portrayal of white women seeps into the public consciousness and discourse. Their words, as void of evidence as they may be, are treated as fact. But don't worry, they also think immigrants to America are automatically anti-black racist as well. Syra will generally say that she is anti-black and everybody will pivot towards me. And I go, well, and black people know it. The uh -huh. gig is up. We know that you, every person who comes to this country as an immigrant believes themselves to be better than us. Based on what? What evidence is there that immigrants come into the country and automatically see themselves as higher up the food chain or the hierarchy than black people, there's no evidence of that. I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. Great job to Anna Kasparian. She explained the situation with race to dinner fantastically. Yeah, so it's basically this group. They bring all these white women across the table and these white women, women pay Sarah Rao and her buddy, uh, Regina Jackson, thousands of dollars to just basically berate them about how racist they are and how much white privilege that they have. I'm not joking, that's a real thing. You can see on their website right now, this is 2023 dinner, one of four, two of four, and they're all sold out. We got Austin, Texas, Denver, Colorado, Palm Beach, Florida, Los Angeles, California, all sold out. Now, the interesting thing is if you go to the Race to Dinner Twitter page, now this is Race to Dinner, this is their Twitter page. If you scroll down, you can see, oh look, here's the Julia Lewis-Dreyfus tweet about the guns are the number one killer of the kids and all that stuff. You scroll down again and you see this tweet from Yvette Nicole Brown saying Samira Rao wants to use the power of white women to repeal the second amendment. So you can see they're using the business Twitter of their race to dinner to promote their other venture, which is this here for the kids gun control group. I don't even know if I can call it a gun control group since they literally just want to ban on all guns. What's the control? They want to ban all guns. So that's interesting. But when you take a look at the group here for the kids that founded by Sarah Rao and all that. Uh, you can see where a lot of this woke language that she uses in her race to dinner meetings and things like that, it seeps into this group as well. In fact, it's kind of foundational to the group and their identity and their message. Take a look at this post, for example, on their Instagram page where it says ban guns and buy them back, pretty simple. And if we scroll down, we can see this. Here for the Kids is calling on Colorado Governor Jared Polis to sign an executive order to ban guns and implement a statewide buyback program. To achieve this goal, we are organizing a sit-in of 25,000 plus white women from around the country on Monday, June 5th at 5 a.m. in Denver, Colorado. This is a national movement with a state focus. Colorado is step one. 
We are respectfully asking white women to put their bodies on the ground for this direct action as marginalized communities have always done and continue to do, as we prioritize the safety of historically marginalized and vulnerable populations such as BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, non-citizens, and disabled folks whose bodies are often on the front lines fighting for human and civil rights, we invite white women to participate in this act of civil disobedience. So first of all, 25,000 plus white women, June 5th at five in the morning. I'm not buying it. I, if I see that, listen, I, I don't know. What, what should we do? Should we, uh, I'll tell you what. If there are 25,000 plus white women at the Capitol in Denver, Colorado on June 5th at five in the morning, uh, I will, I got it. I got it. Here's what I'll do. I will literally sell one of my guns at the gun buyback in Houston, Texas coming up uh, here in the next week or so. So if there are 25,000 plus white women at the Capitol in Denver, Colorado on June 5th at five in the morning, I will give up one of my guns at the gun buyback uh, coming up soon. Now, if those numbers aren't the case, which I highly doubt those numbers will be the case, I, I can't imagine. First of all, I, again, 25,000 plus people, period. That's hard to get anywhere. Now you're limiting it to women, white women, at five in the morning, on a Monday. Who wants to get up on a Monday morning, five in the morning? People, people have to work typically. I don't know. Like, you can see why I thought this was a troll in the beginning. Now, if those numbers aren't met, if there aren't 25,000 plus white women at the Capitol in Denver, Colorado at five in the morning, uh, how about you support your bro, Nuance Bro, at nuancebro.com slash join. Become a member, support the show, really helps out so we can go fly out and do things like cover this event and make more videos like this. Also, if you guys can at this point in the video, give this video a thumbs up. It really helps us in the algorithm, really helps push this video out, get exposure in the algorithm. And leave a comment down below. Do you think there's gonna be the 25,000 plus white women at the Capitol June 5th in Denver, Colorado at five in the morning? Uh, let me know because I'm highly skeptical, but I want to know what you guys think uh, down in the comments below. Now, in recent weeks, as this event comes to a head, it's getting closer and closer. Local media and even some national media have been covering this event. And of course, we're not going to go through all the coverage, but there's some particular ones I want to highlight because they are hilarious. This was from the local Fox affiliate, Fox 31. Colorado's very own. And it says, parents join here for the kids campaign to ban guns in Colorado. Yeah, the goal is to get 25,000 women here to the state capitol on June 5th. They want Governor Polis to sign an executive order banning sales of guns here in Colorado, but opponents say it's unconstitutional. Huh. Knocking on door. Hi there. After door. Um. We are with Here for the Kids. We are an anti-gun violence group. To gain support. Maybe we go on that side. The organization Here for Kids wants to recruit 25,000 women for a sit-in at the state capitol on June 5th. The goal to get Governor Jared Polis to sign an executive order to ban guns and start a statewide buyback program. There's not going to be marching. There's not going to be chanting. There's not going to be speakers. This is solemn. This is grieving. This is healing. This is us just sitting and just saying this is our last ditch effort to save our kids. Syra Rao co-founded the organization in March after the school shooting in Nashville. There's literally nobody in this country who wants to get shot shopping at H&M. There's literally nobody in this country who wants to drop their kid off at school and, and, and have them killed at school. A spokesperson from the governor's office said in a statement, the governor supports the right to peacefully demonstrate in these individuals' calls to improve safety and prevent gun violence. Their specific request for an executive order banning all guns would simply be unconstitutional. I just have to stop it right there because that is hilarious. The governor actually came out, gave this group attention and said, yeah, I know you guys are coming to the Capitol to tell me to do this, uh, this crazy order, but uh, yeah, it's plainly unconstitutional. This is the Democratic governor of Colorado who just passed gun control, I think uh, yesterday, uh, banning ghost guns or whatever in the state of Colorado. I mean, this is no pro-gun guy. He's an anti-gun Democrat governor of Colorado, and even he is saying this is plainly unconstitutional. We can't do this, so we're not going to do this. No way. 
But watch this. This is the icing on the cake. Despite this message from the governor's office, Rao is confident the sit-in will bring change. This is new. They've never seen it before, and I wholeheartedly believe that they're going to do it. I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't believe it with, with all of my heart and soul. So that's just priceless. Even after the governor comes out with the own and says, hey, this is plainly unconstitutional. We're not going to do it, what you're asking for, this executive order to ban all guns. Are you crazy? What are you talking about? She still comes out and says, I believe he's going to do it. I believe he's going to pass this executive order to ban all guns. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be here. I believe it with all my heart. You know, this is this is not uh, Dragon Tales where you can wish, you can wish with all your heart. I wish, I wish with all my heart to fly with dragons in a land apart. By the way, how many times have gun owners heard this phrase, hey, hey, don't worry, nobody's coming to take your guns. Nobody's coming for your guns. Nobody's coming for your guns. The notion that I or Hillary or Democrats or whoever you want to choose are hell bent on taking away folks guns is just not true. In fact, related to this note, there is a very popular group on Instagram known as the Progressivists. As you can see here, the Progressivists has 842,000 followers on Instagram. And one of their first stories over here, you can see it's the effing guns. If we go to their link tree, we can see their first link is here for the kids, the movement to end gun violence. They also have a link to gun control support moms demand action, a separate gun control organization. They have a link to Sarah Rao and Regina Jackson's book called White Women, which you can see here called White Women, everything you already know about your own racism and how to do better. And it has a white woman tear right there on the front of the cover. And they got a stop the NRA link as well. So this group is pretty invested in gun control. Now, when we go to the Progressivist website and we go to their social media team page, we can see Joe Lorenz is the co-founder along with her husband, Will Lorenz. And we got this chick, Sadia Mirza. She is the senior editor at the Progressivists. Now she recently appeared on an episode of a podcast called Cocktails and Capitalism. The title of the podcast was America's Gun Violence Epidemic with Sadia Mirza. And the host discusses with her this myth that Democrats want to take away your guns. This is a good point to kind of pivot to talking about a lot of the myths surrounding gun laws and gun restrictions and gun violence in America. You did a really fantastic job of, of kind of listing out a whole bunch of these myths and addressing them. So I really want to dive into it first, just talking about the myth that the Democrats and that we are coming for your guns. Yeah, that, that, and, and they always forget that people on the left, a lot of them do have, and I'm not counting myself because I, I do not, but a lot of people on the left do value their Second Amendment rights and they are armed. They just yeah. aren't out blaring that they're doing it. And yeah. we've never come for your guns. We've never taken away your guns. Liberals, leftists, progressives, Democrats have never taken away your guns, but your guns have taken away our children. So oh, there's gosh. only there's only one perpetuated fact here is that there's only one side that's constantly taking and the other side that 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 is literally doing nothing. So isn't that funny? This girl who apparently you know, oh, nobody wants to take your guns. We don't want to take your guns. The Democrats don't want to take your guns. It's just you guys who your guns take lives away from us, but we never do anything against you guys. We, you know, a lot of the people on the left, we love the guns, whatever. It was Second Amendment. But now they're involved and in promoting this event and working together, cross-posting, you know, promoting the posts together. You can see this post on the Progressivist page, for example, where it says, if you want to do more than empathize, please follow and support Here for the Kids Action. We need to prove to these people that we see them and will fight for them. Join Here for the Kids Action to stand up for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and for the neglected rights of so many people. So they're not coming for your guns, except they support an organization that is coming for your guns and their literal explicit mission is to ban all guns and mandatory buy them back via executive order. Now we have to get to the best interview of all. This is, of course, Sarah Rao on The Readout on MSNBC with Joy Reid. Thank you both very much. And Sarah, uh, I am just going to give you the floor and uh, let you explain to me your radical uh, idea for what we can actually do about this nonsense. Uh, it's actually not that radical, Joy. You know, what I would argue is radical is that we have grown accustomed to dropping our kids off at school 
and not knowing if they're going to come back alive. Going to the grocery store and not knowing if we're going to get assassinated. Going to the mall and getting murdered. That's radical. What we are proposing is banning guns and buying them back. That's sensible. So right off the bat, that's pretty wild. She says, banning guns and buying them back. That's sensible. Words don't mean anything, apparently. Uh, I guess asking for an executive order that the governor already told you, the Democrat anti-gun governor, by the way, already told you is plainly unconstitutional. It's sensible to demand that he ban all guns via executive order and buy them back. Literally violates the Second Amendment, the Constitution. That's sensible because words don't mean anything. Guns are the number one killer of kids in America. Sit with that. Sit with that. Guns are the number one killer of children in America. And folks are saying it's radical to ban guns. No, it's actually radical that we've decided to live with this. So let's start with this first claim. Are guns the number one killer of kids in America? Well, it depends what you classify as kids. For example, if infants are included, rankings of the leading causes of death for children up to age 18 change. Congenital abnormalities are the leading cause of death in infants and surpass the number of firearm deaths among all children up to age 18. In 2020, there were 4,403 deaths from congenital abnormalities, 3,141 deaths from short gestation or preterm birth and low birth weight, and 1,389 deaths from sudden infant death syndrome. There were 11 infant deaths caused by a firearm in 2020. So if we count a child as anybody under the age of 18, and we're including infants in there, then this is a false stat. Now, if you narrow the parameters to ages one through 17, then yes, firearms are the leading cause of death, among children. And of course, they're not counting abortion in this either because they don't believe that constitutes a child or a life or whatever. So abortion numbers are out the window and those would by far be the biggest number. But we'll get back to these stats in a bit. Enough bulletproof backpacks? That's radical. What's sensible? Ban guns and buy them back. And that's what Here for the Kids is doing. So we know that Australia did that and, and you know, after one mass shooting, but in the United, but they don't have a thing called the Second Amendment. And I'm just going to put it up on screen. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of a people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And we know that that was passed because of fear of rebellions, right? Fear of rebellions and that, the, you know, the, the regulated part, uh, well-regulated, implies the government can regulate arms. But the Constitution says people have a right to have them. How can you ban something that's in the Constitution as something people have a right to have? Well, let's talk about the Second Amendment. So the Second Amendment, in reality, actually fear of rebellion by whom? By enslaved people. That's why we have the Second Amendment. And people in Massachusetts, because there were two rebellions by white folks as well. So Fine. rebellion, sure, period. sure. Yeah. But read uh, The Second by Carol Anderson. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful book. Uh, we have the Second Amendment because of white supremacy and anti-blackness. Give slave owners the right to massacre their enslaved people. So we have it. White supremacy, anti-blackness, proliferation of guns since 1791 when it was ratified. White people buy guns in mass when they get super scared by people who look like you and me. These are facts. Google it. Obama, Ferguson, George Floyd, 9-11, COVID-19. That's part two. Number three, guns are now the number one killer of kids in America, including white kids. One plus two plus three equals four. White supremacy is now the number one killer of all kids in America, including white kids. I'm ready to get rid of the Second Amendment. I, and I think it's wild that people would prefer to protect an amendment, a racist amendment from 1791 over their own children. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, they talk about the Second Amendment. Joy Reid already gets it wrong saying, well, the well-regulated part implies that the government can regulate it, like using this modern interpretation of what the word regulate means, which is not what it meant at the time of ratification, but whatever. We're not going to get too into the weeds on that. But they both talk about the Second Amendment being state militias' abilities to put down rebellions. Joy Reid mentions the rebellions from white people, assuming she's talking about the Shays Rebellion and Whiskey Rebellion, which are some of the most famous ones. But Sarah Rao talks about, oh, this was actually, the purpose was to put down slave rebellions. And that was a big part about why the Second Amendment, uh, you know, came into being. And she mentions this book, by Carol Anderson called The Second. Now, Carol Anderson's book, The Second, is kind of reminiscent of the 1619 Project, a project which many mainstream historians disagree with and say is not historically accurate. Similarly with The Second, it's not really based in historical fact. Stephen Hallbrook, a historian himself who's written extensively on the Second Amendment, 
has some thoughts of his own on this matter. As you can see here from the Independent Institute, the Second Amendment was adopted to protect liberty, not slavery, a reply to professors Bogus and Anderson. So the idea that the Second Amendment was designed to protect slavery and put down slave rebellions, this was first published by Professor Carl Bogus in a 1998 law review article called The Hidden History of the Second Amendment. His basic argument is that the amendment was adopted so that the Southern states could maintain militias to suppress slave rebellions. New life was given to the thesis by Professor Carol Anderson in her 2021 book, The Second, which asserts that the amendment was, quote, not some hallowed ground, but rather a bribe paid again with black bodies. As Bogus concedes, no direct evidence supports the thesis. Instead, historical fact refutes it. The predecessor of the amendment was the English Declaration of Rights of 1689, which protected the rights of Protestants to have arms. England had no domestic slave population. The slave plantations of England were in other countries, not in England itself. Beginning in 1776, some states adopted Bill of Rights that recognized the right to bear arms. Three of them were northern states that abolished slavery. When the federal constitution was proposed in 1787, it was criticized for a lack of Bill of Rights. Demands for recognition of the right to bear arms emanated from anti-federalists, including abolitionists in the northern states, while several southern states ratified without demanding amendments at all. New Hampshire, whose Bill of Rights was read to abolish slavery, was the first state to ratify the Constitution and demand a prohibition on the disarming of citizens. And I don't want to read the whole article. You can read it yourself if you want. Uh, Stephen Halbrook is a, an amazing resource. He wrote multiple books like The Right to Bear Arms, uh, gun control in Nazi-occupied France, gun control in the Third Reich, the Founders' Second Amendment, and that every man be armed. You can see the books here. So this seems to undercut the idea that the Second Amendment was some sort of weapon of white supremacy to keep black people enslaved, put down slave rebellions, and that it's actually bad for black people. In fact, the real weapon, if you want to say, of white supremacy or to keep black people down was gun control, not the Second Amendment. In fact, Carol Anderson writes about such prohibitions in her book, but I guess Sarah Rao has an agenda to push, so she's not going to highlight that aspect. Now, she made the point that white people en masse, when things happen, then they're reacting or scared of black people. They buy a lot more guns. They buy, they, they buy all the guns, and this is shown. We've seen it. Uh, so that's how you know it's a tool of white supremacy. Well, here's the interesting data. Here you can see from Axios, April 23rd, 2022, why more people of color are buying guns. By the numbers, the initial surge in firearms purchases was in part driven by the pandemic as fear and uncertainty set in, according to Mark Oliva, spokesperson for the Firearm Industry Trade Association, National Shooting Sports Foundation, Retailer surveys conducted by NSSF showed that between 2019 and 2020, there was a 58% increase in African Americans buying guns, 49% increase in Hispanic Americans buying guns, 43% increase in Asian Americans buying firearms. These rates of increase remained unchanged between 2020 and 2021 among nearly 60% of retailers. And if you wanna talk about the first half of 2020, I mean, we're talking peak COVID here, we're talking about the George Floyd riots, uh, if you want to see the data around that, we'll take a look at this. Again, from the National Shooting Sports Foundation, firearm and ammunition sales. We scroll down, we can see this infographic here. And if we scroll down, demographics. For any demographic that you had an increase, please specify the percentage increase. Average percent sales increase retailers reported during the first half of 2020. For white, we had 51.9%. For black, we had 58.2%. For Hispanic, we had 49.4%. Asian, 42.9%. So the increase in blacks was actually higher than the increase in whites. Granted, the overall numbers are a bit different because of population size, but we're talking about the increase from baseline from what they're usually uh, used to. So you had the increase in blacks higher than any other demographic. This doesn't really bode well for what she's talking about here, especially when she listed COVID-19. Oh, the whites are the one, they're, they're, they're the ones, it's the increase is all from the whites. The whites are the ones buying the guns. This is what we see. Well, no, it's actually here. It's from the blacks. And Hispanics are effectively tied with whites here as far as the increase. 
Then comes this claim again that guns are the number one killer of children. Again, we've been over this before. It depends what you define as children, excluding infants, excluding abortions. But then she also says this amazing line. Guns are now the number one killer of kids in America, including white kids. One plus two plus three equals four. White supremacy is now the number one killer of all kids in America, including white kids. She says, including white children. Well. What does that mean? Well, yeah, if you include them in the overall numbers of what we are defining as children, which is one through 18, one through uh, 19, one through 17, whatever, then yeah, the overall number, which includes white children, uh, the firearm deaths are higher than the you know second cause of death or whatever. But that doesn't mean for white children, you know, it's also true. That's not what that means because I actually decided to go through the numbers myself. So underlying cause of death, 2018 through 2021, single race results, death occurring through 2021. This is from the CDC wonder page. It's a fantastic resource. Uh, here we have by age, by race, we have number of deaths. And if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see injury mechanism and all other leading causes, motor vehicle traffic. We have the ages, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. So this is for motor vehicle traffic. And if you just want to parse out the white numbers, we go line by line by line by line and add those all up. Unfortunately, they don't list the total down here, but I did the math. You can look at these numbers and do the math yourself, but for whites, the number for motor vehicle accident deaths for whites one through 17 is 1,567. If we go to firearm deaths, again, this is CDC wonder, underlying cause of death, same everything, whatever. And we scroll down, you can see injury mechanism and all other leading causes, firearm, and we see all the other stuff. We go up, we see by year the numbers, one through 17. And if we add it all up, then the number for whites one through 17 is 1,193. That means there's almost 400 less firearm deaths for white kids age one through 17 than there are motor vehicle traffic incidents for the same demographic. You can also see in this graph from the Kaiser Family Foundation, firearm deaths of children and adolescents continued to rise in 2021, especially among black youth. If we scroll down, we can see that these are the firearm related deaths for children and adolescents by race slash ethnicity from 2018 through 2021. They're color coded for the different years. Here's the different races. And you can see the increase is almost exclusively from black kids. You can see the number doubled from six in 2018 to 12 in 2021. This is per 100,000 rates. The rate for white kids is basically the same. Rate for Hispanics has increased, but still fairly low compared to blacks. The numbers for Asians actually went down from 2018. So yeah, Sarah Rouse claims there about this is even true for white kids if that's what she meant, or she was trying to play weird linguistic games to say if you include white kids in the numbers overall, whatever. But white kids alone, no, that is not true. It's not the leading cause of death for white kids, but it is for black kids. But the rise is almost exclusively from the increase in black youth violence against one another. Um, June 5th, 5 a.m., 25,000 white women, state capital, Denver, Colorado, demanding Democratic Governor Jared Polis sign an executive order, buy guns and uh, ban guns and buy them back, ban guns and buy them back. And why, why you said specifically white women? Because white women traditionally have the most power in this country. That's why marketers are like women between white women between the ages of 25 and 55, right? That's what advertisers go after. And white women have the most privilege in terms of the least likely to be harmed by police. 25,000 numbers. Let's get a ton of them. They will get him to do it. They will get him to do it. We know that if history is any guy, they will get him to do it. So you heard it there again from Sarah Rao herself, the 25,000 plus white women at 5 a.m. at the Capitol in Denver, uh, and that they will get him to do it. If history is any uh, indicator, they're going to get him to do it. Now, again, I made my bet. I don't think they're going to get him to do it. And he said himself he's not going to do it. It's plainly unconstitutional. But uh it's pretty incredible seeing this on MSNBC. Uh, Joy Reid is pretty crazy herself. And, you know, this is uh, Miss uh, running in Central Park, double masked outside, even when vaccinated. Like, 
you know, whack job. But yeah, this is what we're dealing with. Now you have to be wondering, what's, what's the real agenda here? Is she really that delusional? Does she really think that this is possible? Or is there another motive here? I can't say. I've always been very confused by Sarah Rao. I mean, at first I thought she was an obvious troll, and then I was like, okay, she's for real, I guess. Um, but then I thought this group was a troll until I saw that it was associated with her. So then I thought it was real, which I, I, I do think the group is real. And it's taking place in Denver, Colorado. They have their own reasons for why they say that's happening that way. I think, first of all, it's because, you know, she lives in Colorado. She lives in Denver. So because she lives there, it's easier for her. Uh, but I do think there's a possibility. I'm not going to say 100% sure, but this is me hypothesizing here. I think this could be a potential lead generation opportunity. Uh, you know, maybe they're getting money from other groups and things like that. It's possible. Sarah Rao, for example, has this venture called Haven Media. As you can see from the website, meet the team, Sarah Rao, co-founder slash board member. And if we look at Cause IQ, which has a lot of the stats around these sort of 501c3s and disclosures and things like that, we can see one of the funding mechanisms for Haven Media is actually the Schwab Charitable Fund, where in 2021, I believe in June, they got about $25,250. And that's just one of the funds that has funded this. Total revenues of $180,544. Total expenses, you see that here total assets. You see that here. Who knows? Maybe this here for the kids thing is a new opportunity, a new venture to maybe, you know, get some of this uh, anti-gun money from these various different uh, groups. But again, my hypothesis, I do think it could also serve as a lead generation funnel for Sarah Rao and her race to dinner project. Again, they're focusing on white women. Who is her clientele that pays her thousands of dollars for these race to dinner things? White women. Who are her books primarily designed for? White women. So if they can create an email list, if they can get these people to show up in person, show their dedication, that could be a screening tool. Again, I'm just theorizing, I'm just hypothesizing, I'm not saying this is absolutely the case, but it's a possibility. What do you think? Do you think this is potentially what I'm saying or think it is? Uh, what are your thoughts? Leave it down in the comments down below. I want to hear your thoughts. Now, will yours truly be covering this event? Well, I'll have to ask you to stay tuned and uh, keep an eye out. But until then, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Social media links are in the description box below, as well as merch. Support us at nuancebro.com join, and I'll see you next time, bro.